Hello everyone. So this is Rock's Drift. The redoubt figures, I have just finished painting the last four, group of four, about a week ago and this has been epic. Um, I think I started painting these figures way back in the 1990s and um, I haven't been doing it continuously. Um, it's stalled basically because they are redoubt figures and redoubts uh, produce lovely figures but they're very large in comparison to most other ranges. And um, what I found was that uh, where I was more than happy with the British, um, I was less satisfied with the Zulus. Not because they're um, bad sculpts or anything like that, just that the um, variations in the poses and so on is very limited. Um, so when you need to produce um, an army of Zulus that's formed of loads and loads, hundreds and hundreds of figures, in order to refight uh, or war game walk strift, um, you really need to have a, a, a larger variety of poses and um, I turned to other ranges and found that the, um, they just sort of didn't look right really mixed together. Um, so um, whereas I have stuck with Redoubt for all the British, um, to give you, a, give you an example of uh, comparisons of scale. This this is um, an Empress figure and um, if I can try and put him alongside find one that's in a similar pose. I don't know if I'll really focus on this with. Um, I think you can see there they're very different in size um, and they don't look right and you, you get people saying it's not a problem because human beings vary in size and uh, you can mix ranges but to me it, it just doesn't look right the proportions look wrong and um, standard items such as for instance the martini henry rifle um, on an empress figure it's going to be smaller than on a redoubt one so it just doesn't look right, and if I don't believe, oh yeah, this figure can just about um, fire over the mealy bags, um, and he's an equivalent height almost to the guy that's kneeling down next to him there. Um, so anyway, to cut long story short, long story short, I um, stuck with Redoubt for the British, but I had to kind of compromise with the Zulus and. Um, you may have seen recently I uploaded a video on Warlord Games Plastic Zulus. So I'm going to complete the Zulu army using a mixture of ranges, but principally now Warlord Games Plastic. And it won't look so bad to have, a, have the opposing army a different size. Um, so I'll take on a little guided tour of this in a minute, but I wanted just to make a few remarks about um, the battle. Um, oh yeah, before I do that as well, another thing that's held me up was that I had quite a lot of these figures from Redoubt, um, which uh, I bought, oh, I don't know, about a year and a half ago, something like that, to make up the, the numbers that I needed. And um, when I got them home, I discovered that they're, they're, they're Scottish, they're, they're in trues. Um, so the two thing, the, the the main thing that's that's different is they have these different sort of uh, cuffs on their sleeves. So um, in the end, I, I had to go at painting the tartan on them, um, but the I've painted him up to represent the ninety first Highlanders um, and the tartan. I don't know how well you can see that. Tartan is clan of Cordor, which is a sort of Campbell. Tartan. Um, so now I've got to make up a unit of these guys. Um, so I had to buy up a lot, a lot more of these in order to uh, 
paint up a, a Highland unit um, for other battles, not for Walk's Drift. But anyway, on with um, what I wanted to say about Wargaming Walk's Drift. Um, I long ago decided I was going to use black powder. This is before the Zulu War supplement for black powder came out. Um, and I've got a few ideas on how to amend the rules in order to refight this particular battle. Um, but the, I'm, I wasn't terribly convinced by when the, the Zulu supplement came out by the the scenario they have for Walks Drift in that game. And the main reason for that is they only have about 50 British figures. And to my mind, if you're going to refight Walks Drift, you have to do it on a one-to-one -one ratio. There's just no getting around it because... Um, you, you have to bear in mind the, the footprint of the buildings themselves and um, if I were to take any figures away from this it would look denuded. Um, I've actually got about 100 and something figures here. Um, there are four units of 24 figures each. They're the principal units. Um, then I've got the command stands which I'll tell you a little bit more in a moment and lots of individual figures that I intend to use as markers. Um, either they'll have a sort of casualty figure or another one, um, other ones that are to do with reloading with ammunition supply. So I can use those to denote casualties and um, what, what, I forget what the expression is in um, in black powder. I think it's disordered. When a unit becomes disordered, I'll put an ammunition marker next to them. Um, so, basically, I don't think I'm going to be using the Zulu supplement scenario. Um, I'm going to stick with my original plan to use black powder and just amend it in ways um, that I've seen fit. Um, I'm going to have three command stands, so there are four units, um, two of them are going to be commanded by Bromhead, uh, this is Bromhead here, two of them are going to be commanded by Acting Commissary Dalton, um, he's the one holding the pistol, and the entire force, the overall commander of course is Chard. Um, he's on the base alongside Ardendorf there. Um, now, my main interest in Walks Drift, like a lot of other people, stems from the film Zulu. Um, I'm of an age where I'm lucky enough to have seen it on its release. It was released in 1964 and went to the cinema with my father um, on its release and was just staggered by it as a boy and my obsession with it has stuck with me my entire life but um, the film is a huge distortion of history and the facts um, it's a spectacular film um, absolutely groundbreaking film but um, it bears very little resemblance to history, um, in particular um, in its portrayal of a lot of the principal characters of the action. Um, Bromhead is uh, played by Michael Caine in the film as a very kind of plummy um, aristocratic officer. Uh, Bromhead was deaf, he had very hard of hearing and as a result was quite a shy retiring man and wasn't particularly popular with the other officers in his mess, um, mainly because he kept himself to himself and that's probably the reason why he was left behind in charge of the depot at Walks Drift. Um, which probably saved his life as he didn't go on with the column and uh, to the defeat of his Umdwana. Um And another person who is very badly 
misrepresented is Commissary Dalton, who in the film is a very kind of foppish, um, almost effeminate kind of character. Um, and when you see his portrayal in the film, you wonder how on earth did he manage to end up winning the VC? Um, in fact, in real life, Dalton was probably the most experienced military man on the, on the base. Um, he'd served 22 years in the army and retired to South Africa in the early 1870s and then um, volunteered for service again in 1877 for one of the Cape Frontier Wars and um, actually was um, the officer in charge of a supply depot during that war so he had a lot of experience a lot of military training and was one of the few people on here to have actually seen military action um, and it's probably Dalton who came up with the idea of stacking up the mealy bags and defending a small perimeter um, in the film and in fact in history as well it's usually the idea is usually attributed to Chard but Dalton was probably the main influence behind the um, successful defence of this mission station. Uh, right, what else? The, another thing that's um, kind of misportrayed in the, in, the, in the film is that um, a lot of the most heroic actions that took place at this battle um, resulted in the deaths of uh, the people who performed those actions. And in 1879, in order to receive the VC, you had to live. Um, there was no posthumous VC. Now you might say, aha, well why is it then that there were two officers at the Battle of Isandwana, Melville and Coghill, who made an attempt to escape with the colours um, and didn't succeed, died as a, as, in, as a result and both received the VC. Well, the reason is that they didn't actually receive the VCs until 1908 um, when they were awarded them retrospectively and by that time, by the Edwardian era, um, recipients of the VC could possibly have died um, as, a, as a result of their bravery. Um, so I think that's kind of all I want to say at long distance. So I'm going to take the camera a little bit closer in a moment. I'll show you all these figures in the building. Um, maybe before I do, I should point out that there are a few things that aren't on the table. Um, the buildings from Redoubt also come with um, a couple of other smaller items that go out a bit further, off, would be off table. There's this um, outdoor loo. Um, there's an outdoor bakery and a small oven and they're all nice pieces that you can put out on the perimeter um, possibly use them to give the Zulus a little bit of cover so anyway I'll take the uh, camera off the tripod and give you a close up view all right so this is the hospital building um, both the buildings have detachable roofs and um, the interior layout of the rooms, I think, is accurate. As far as I can see from a map of the hospital that I've got in a, a book upstairs, um, this is exactly how the rooms were laid out. And in particular, you'll notice these rooms at the back here, um, with the exception of this one here, um, don't have doors, oh yeah, oh yeah that one there does as well, um, but these two rooms here, this one, uh, this one, only have doors leading onto the outside and uh, that made it terrifying for the defenders um, because they had to barricade the doors and shoot through the door and through loopholes that they made in the walls with the Zulu swarming outside here. And um, when the Zulus finally managed to break the doors down, um, their only option was to 
um, dig through the walls with their bayonets um, to try and escape along this route here and out through that window there. Um, and in this room here, um, there was one particular soldier, Joseph Williams, who was killed um, because he couldn't get out and the Zulus managed to break through this door here. And his, his action is a good example um, that he fought extremely bravely, but was um, pulled out of the room and uh, disemboweled by the Zulus and didn't win the VC. Um, now, this mealy bag here, um, this whole area was actually on a raised ledge, so beneath these mealy bags would have been a, a sort of rocky shelf. Um, and when the British were forced out of this section of the perimeter and they retreated across to that area there, um, this area here became a big problem because the Zulus were in a kind of hidden, uh, hidden from their fire. Um, and this is where Corporal Sheese, who is this chap here, um, won his VC because he actually leapt over the mealy bag uh, um, perimeter in order to try and clear this area of Zulus who were hiding along under this ledge here. Um, so again, here's another character in the film Zulu who is um, portrayed in an entirely different manner um, to his actual historical um, personality. So we got one unit of British here, and a second unit here, and as I say, these two units I'm going to have controlled by Dalton there. Um, and along the front here, we have um, another unit. Uh, this chap here doesn't feature in the film, Chaplain Smith, who um, was very prominent in handing out ammunition. Um, and I think the only reason for that can be that um, the film actually portrays uh, Jack Hawkins as Vit, the missionary, who wasn't actually present um, by the time this battle took place. And I think to have portrayed another kind of evangelical Christian kind of character would have clashed too much with the way they wanted to present uh, Jack Hawkins in the film. Um, another unit over there defending the other front and as I say both those units are going to be commanded by Bromhead and then I'm going to have Chard as the overall commander so he can give orders to all the units on the British side. Uh, what else? We've got the main redoubt over here, which um, in real life may not have even been... This is more or less how it was is portrayed in the film, but um, in actuality it may just have been at, at the pile of sandbags... That, or not sandbags, uh, mealy bags that were just piled up outside the store here. Um, and the, the, the troops just clambered up on top of them. It was a final uh, last resort high point that they could have retreated to. But um, Redoubt had modelled it with a firing step and so on. So I haven't got a big problem with that. And um, this is the stores. And in fact, once the hospital building had been overrun by the Zulus and then caught fire, um, the... British had kind of retreated to this area here. One of the things I'm thinking of getting is um, the Warlord Games building actually do a water, um, what you call it, a water cart, which was over here. And um, it, some of the VCs were won by um, 
soldiers who cross back into this area during the night in order to reacquire the water and drag it back over here to give the men a drink. Um, so that would make an interesting addition. It would obviously be slightly out of scale, um, but I think I'm probably going to get around to acquiring that. But anyway, once the hospital had uh, fallen, um, Surgeon Reynolds, who you can see there, with his blood-soaked apron, um, performed the rest of his uh, surgery and operations and so on on the veranda of the storehouse. Um, and it was the storehouse, obviously, where the mealy bags came from. So I've still got a, few, a couple of figures there who are still um, doing their bit to finish off the defences. Um, I've got some figures here that are lying firing. So I'm going to actually use those um, to mark which sides of the building are being defended by um, these units, if there's a unit inside a building. Um, so that one unit cannot defend more than two sides of a building. So I'll put the figures on the corner of the two sides that they're defending. That's my plan anyway. And, um, oh yeah, the, the, other, the only thing that I'm not particularly keen on with this sort of buildings is the stone corral at the end here, which is just basically four walls. They're perfectly good walls, but this isn't actually how the... Um, the stone corral was laid out. It actually had partitions in the middle. So I'm probably going to scratch build a, a corral um, and just use those as generic bits of scenery. Um, so there we go. That's, uh, that's everything I've got to say on it, I think. Um, I'm about halfway through painting up my Zulus, I think. Um, and I'm hoping this will give me the impetus to get on and crack on and finish them now. Um, the British are going to be one to one figure ratio. Um, the Zulus are in a way, but I won't need, there were 4,000 Zulus approximately attacking the mission station and I'm not going to need 4,000 figures, mainly because, uh, well two reasons. One is that um, I'm going to modify the black powder rules so that when they reach 50% casualties, they don't break off the table. So in other words, um, I, can, I only really have to represent 2,000 of the Zulus. And then I'm going to um, allow them so many attacks. So I'll bring them back onto the table, I don't know, five times maybe, something like that. And that will mean I only need, uh, what's that, about 400 figures. Uh, and as I say, I'm probably halfway through at the moment. So um, I'm hoping to be able to crack on and get that done soon. But um, the way I paint could be any time this decade. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'll put a few still photos on at the end as well. So you can see the pictures in a little bit closer detail. Uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video. Bye for now.